Who's the hottest boy on the set? What'd you have to say? Oh, gosh, don't ask me that. I'm blushing. No, I'm just kidding. I think they're all really handsome. I guess you guys would all agree with me on that. Welcome to Sleepover Cinema, where we analyze the movies, shows, and music that created the collective unconscious of those who thought Pacific Coast Academy was real. I'm Hannah Leach. And I'm Audrey Leach, a woman who loves a long line cami. And today we are executing an oddly topical act of season scheduling. We're going to explore the good, the bad, and the nonsensical aspects of a show that made us all want to be just a bit older than we were. And what exactly does that mean in 2024? We'll find out together as we discuss Nickelodeon's Zoe 101. Are you ready? Ooh. Hi, everyone. Hello. So, yeah, Zoe 101. (laughs) Dan Schneider, quiet on set. It just came out not that long ago. We both are up to speed. We've seen the whole thing. Yeah. That is a conversation all its own that we're not going to ignore during this episode because how could you? The content of Zoe 101 comes from this man's mind in a lot of ways. Here's the thing with this whole Quiet On Set doc series. It is undeniable that its release has pumped up his show's streaming numbers yeah. by probably like a thousand percent. So probably. because it's like you you rewatch and you're seeing all these clips and you're like, oh, I want to go back and confirm what's being said or like try to view it differently or like see what really is the worst of the worst. I went back to the Amanda show to like see what <laughs> it actually was because when you watch something as a child, there's like certain elements that you'll remember, but you kind of don't remember most of it. I want that to be a question that we're asking and kind of trying to discuss in in this episode is like, is there still a place for the streaming and distribution of these shows current children could watch i don't really think they need to i don't think that's necessary to spread the humor of 2008 right (laughs) you know like on disney plus how they have the like disclaimers yes yes (laughs) like i feel like they should be available somewhere because i don't know it's 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 icky i kind of okay i want to talk more about this but let's come back to it because I do have some thoughts that are related much to talk about in this vein and also coincidentally we chose this show of course Dan Schneider being weird has been an open secret but we chose it before things popped off and now we're like well this is very timely so we're just having the conversation all of that being said are we ready to get into the facts No. (laughs) No, we are. (laughs) Well, we're going to. Zoe 101 is a teen comedy slash drama starring Jamie Lynn Spears. There were four seasons of it, and it ran from 2005 to 2008. The IMDb synopsis is... The adventures of a group of high school friends slash students while they are living on campus at Pacific Coast Academy. Balancing multiple things in life, they support each other and meet new people along the way. Whatever happens, they do everything they can to pull through. That's like an awful synopsis, but that is kind of just what it is. It's not much deeper than that. The network, of course, that Zoe 101 played on was Nickelodeon, and the show was created by Scott Fellows and Dan Schneider. Scott Fellows is a writer. He was a writer on Big Time Rush, Johnny Test, Super Noobs, which is much, much, uh, very past our time. He was credited as a creator for Unfabulous, and he just, like, was a Nickelodeon guy through and through. He is the main guy for Ned's Declassified School Survival Guy. Oh, yeah, you're right. With all this quiet on set stuff, I'm sure you guys are aware of the existence of the Ned's Declassified podcast. On that show, they've repeated a million times over that Scott Fellows 
was not a Dan Schneider. Like, they just did not have this sort of experience. They had a very, you know, still stressful. All those things still exist, but, like, not coming from the top down. It's just interesting to know that these two worked together at the outset of the show. I didn't know that. Well, I did notice as we went through and watched the episodes that there were some credits where Dan wasn't an executive producer and somewhere he was. So I feel like maybe he kind of came in and out of this one a bit more. I don't know. I mean, it's so Dan Schneider everything, though, like it infused into the DNA of like, like what yeah, he's like obsessed with, like weird technology and like things that don't exist and like energy drinks and like feet in short dan schneider was ousted from nickelodeon in march of 2018 but before then he was an executive producer slash writer on game shakers henry danger victorious iCarly, drake and josh zoe 101 all that keenan and kel what i like about you the amanda show and a bunch of like made for tv movies that nickelodeon made etc he was one of the most important people at nickelodeon and probably the most important for a while getting into the cast so right off the top we have jamie lynn spears as zoe brooks of course jamie lynn spears is the younger sister of britney spears she was in all 61 episodes of the show as the show was named after her so she kind of fell off after Zoe 101 for reasons that we'll discuss. But since then, she was in Sweet Magnolias. She's gone into music a bit. She was very maligned in the Free Britney case situation. I personally am not an expert on the Free Britney movement. I did a decent amount of research on it. And a lot of it kind of seems like hearsay or just like rumored to XYZ. But The point is, the vibes are off. Of course, we all know, Jamie's personal life caused quite a stir in December of 2007 when it was announced that she was pregnant at age 16. A lot of people think that Zoe 101 was canceled or the series came to a conclusion in reaction to her having gotten pregnant, but that is not true. The show finished airing in spring of 2008, but just coincidentally, they had already decided that the show had run its course and it was wrapped by then. But I did find some very interesting quotes from her with this um in this interview she did with cosmopolitan audrey will you play the role of jamie lynn throughout these blocks in today's world immediately i'd have my social media to post something and it'd be cleared up but even today people still have their thoughts about it i didn't become pregnant until probably six months after we wrapped or something like that but some of the episodes had not aired yet I think that there was a conversation with Nickelodeon, rightfully so, of do we air these episodes? But the show had already wrapped and there was never a negotiation to go into any more seasons. We were too old. It was done. (laughs) After the news of the pregnancy broke, Jamie Lynn packed her bags and moved to Mississippi for a chance at a new life. She said, I got me a little house. I put a big gate up around it and I was like, I'm going to stay here, raise my baby and figure this out because this is real life. I have put myself in this situation i'm not condoning it or saying it's right but these are the cards that i have to play she continued and i tried to do the best that i could and yet sure enough everywhere i went in mississippi for that whole nine months there was always paparazzi on me everywhere i went but i just knew that if i stayed away from it long enough that i could give my child some sense of normalcy back in her life i actually think the premise of she got herself a little house and put a big gate up around it and is like the pregnant younger sister of a huge pop star is a really good premise yeah. for some kind of story. So there's our backstory on Miss Jamie Lynn, the rest of the cast. A lot of these people were child actors whose careers peaked with Zoe 101. And after that, they would do like short films or like one-off things. But most of these people seem to have moved on from acting. And I also included how many episodes of Zoe 101 they were on because it varies sort of a lot and it's interesting. Again, there were 61 episodes overall. 
Paul Butcher played Zoe's younger brother, Dustin Brooks. He was on all 61 episodes as well. Then we have Christopher Massey, older brother of Kyle Massey of Corey in the House and That's So Raven, fun fact, as Michael Barrett. He was in all 61 episodes. We have Aaron Sanders as Quinn Penske. She was in 60 episodes. She also was a regular on Big Time Rush, which I did not know. Then we have Matthew Underwood as Logan Reese, 61 episodes. Never forget when we met him in that mall. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, we've told that story before. <laughs> I don't remember which episode, but we did. Then we have Sean Flynn as Chase Matthews. He was in 52 episodes because he was like in England for part of the last season, at least in universe. And then we have Victoria Justice as Lola Martinez. She was in 47 episodes. And as Audrey said, she has moved on and continued to act or like do things in the public eye. She, of course, was the lead in Victorious. She was Janet in Rocky Horror Live. She was in Eye Candy. And who could forget her song, My Best Friend's Brother? One among many of her random songs. Then we have Alexa Nicholas as Nicole. She was in 25 episodes. And before Zoe 101, she was in Hidden Hills. I want to return to Alexa. Because she is I have on YouTube. <laughs> I know. That's what I want to talk about. Yeah. Then we have Abby Wilde as Stacey Dilson. She was in 28 episodes and has not really done anything after this, but oddly reprised her role as Stacey Dilson in iCarly and Sam and Cat. Jack Salvatore Jr. played Mark Del Figolo, 25 episodes. He was in 10 Things I Hate About You. And then lastly, we have Kristen Herrera as Dana Cruz. She was only on one season. It was the first season. She was in 13 episodes. She's also in Freedom Writers, which I found to be funny. When I went to look up like why she left, there were like a decent amount of ideas, but kind of the through line is that she was kind of like a menace on set. And apparently they recorded this episode where they were like standing out like not in the ocean but like next to the ocean standing on some rocks and allegedly she like pushed alexa nicholas into some rocks <laughs> when they were filming an episode because alexa's always like she attacked me something i noticed with the cast of mm -hmm. zoe 101 is that it really feels like they cast the friend group to fill certain archetypes. And then as the show went on and those characters changed or they became more conventional in some way, yeah. they would replace the original archetype with somebody else. So like, for example, yeah. Stacy and Quinn, I feel that is the situation. Yes. And Mark Del Figolo and like Chase. Kind of. Yeah. They're different, but like they, I feel like all the main cast got like cool in some yeah. way. So they were humanized more. Yeah. They like the show. And so they're like, great. Now we can add some more kids to make fun of or like to make little right. freaks on the show. Yeah. So for the majority of the cast, they made a return to the silver screen in zoe 102 which is exactly what it sounds like it is a flash forward sequel where logan and quinn are getting married now three members of the original cast did not come back for the movie so smart it, <laughs> yes it was alexa nicholas who played nicole victoria justice who played lola and paul butcher who played dustin interesting reasoning for each person's choice to not come back. So Victoria Justice had this to say. She said, it was not because of a lack of love for the cast and for that show. I am so grateful to the people that I worked with the whole time for that chunk of my life and for being on that show. Zoe 101 is what put me on the map in that whole world and I have the best time making it. I love that cast so much, each of them. They all hold a very special place in my heart. I so, have a running theory that the Victorious cast made a pact with each other to not say anything on Dan Schneider or these topics. Because if you think about it, yeah. none of them have, and there's a lot of them. So I just think that they have a pact with each other. And Victoria Justice, that would be a part of her actual reasoning, her real reasoning to not be in, in the movie. I think they all have very real experiences and know, understand exactly where everybody's coming from, but they've made this collective decision to just stay out of it in the public. Her reasoning to not be in this movie is very obvious. First of all, 
ew. And second, yeah. <laughs> she kind of had, like, Victorious is her show. Do you know what I mean? Like, right, on what world yeah. is she going to go back and, like, revert back to her, like, smaller role? That's true. Like, it's just not going to happen. She did. She claimed scheduling issues. I got to say, it took me way too long to realize the show name was a pun on her name. Really? Yeah. I legit was just like, wow. I don't. I just didn't think about it. Like, I literally. You were like, so they're victorious. Yeah, I was like, I don't know what that means, but okay. (laughs) So that was Victoria's statement. Then we have Alexa Nicholas, who is very, very, very vocal and has been very, very vocal about Zoe 101 having been bad for her, which is real. We don't really understand the depth of her experience. And the way that she was used in Quiet on Set was actually pretty minimal compared to. Yeah how much she's said publicly herself like been willing to put out there herself yeah I do feel like this whole thing has defined her it clearly there's she's got a lot of her self-worth and history wrapped up in this because it's what people know her for which I would assume would be incredibly frustrating she has kids I know that and so she is concerned with changing laws when it comes to children on set so I think that's yeah. all if you got to be really loud and obnoxious about it that's pretty much the only way you're ever gonna gain any yeah traction. that's true I respect it if it can result in laws changing then I think that's necessary yeah yeah I agree and lastly we have Paul Butcher who played Dustin the younger brother he thought that the idea of there being a reboot was really stupid and he made fun of it on the internet like a lot. Common Sense Media popped off on this show. Audrey, will you take us through this? Common Sense Media gives Zoe 101 three stars and says it's appropriate for ages eight and up. Tweens will love this fluffy California dream. Parents need to know that this upbeat series is about kids let loose in a peer-dominated world where privilege is a way of life. Tween viewers are going to love the California coastline, the sunny days, and easy life. Parents might cringe for the same reasons. Zoe and her friends live in an utterly unreal world where her character confesses during a truth or dare type game that once I burped in church. This is admitted by a kid wearing full makeup and a miniskirt. How do innocence and being expected to make adult choices coexist in the 21st century? Let's hope that kids viewing this show go a little deeper for answers than these characters. Nick has kept Zoe 101's plot pretty shallow for a reason. Without adult supervision, kids in the circumstances that they appear in this program would get into a lot of trouble. But besides some bickering and tricky behavior, these are pretty well-mannered kids. Fantasy, you be the judge. I love common sense media. Like, the writing is so good. I think it definitely did strike me as being extremely unreal. I was too, I was an anxious child. Like, I didn't even want to do, like, sleepaway camp. I mean, it was just not happening. So, like, I didn't personally (laughs) feel that I wanted to, like, move to PCA. But, like, I would, I would like a day tour or something. Right, 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 right. (laughs) Which is actually just uh, Pepperdine University. Right. And when I drove past it, I was shocked. (laughs) Like, in real life, I was absolutely shook critical reception i just pulled a little chunk from a review from variety that was written in 2005 zoe 101 or more aptly how to try to grow an american idol is an elaborately devised proving ground for diva in training jamie lynn spears nickelodeon sees stars in spears future and a predictable zoe is her springboard Nickelodeon, known to provide a little more edge to its shows, instead goes for an over-the-top take on reality. Sure, Schneider tries to imbue the show with deeper messages like learning to cope with messy roommates and how to survive on a scant weekly allowance, but it's hard to focus on any subtext in a world virtually devoid of parents, and adults for that matter, amid a ridiculously affluent lifestyle. Instead of using Zoe's character as a reality check in the world straight out of pottery barn teen schneider portrays all of this opulent materialism as the norm come on pbt i I know they had to mention pbt and i respect them for that i mean it is true that they illustrate and this is something dan openly has admitted to that he tries to give power back to the children viewers by making the adults in the show 
that it do exist kind of stupid. Yeah. It, to make the kids feel like they have control or some power over adults in their life. And he, the way that he phrased that, I got that from like a New York Times article that I sent you a while ago. The way that he's phrasing that makes it sound really holy. Like there's kids out yeah. there who have no, well, obviously you're a minor, so you literally don't have power. But yeah, he's trying to say that by portraying adults in his shows the way that he does that it is inherently helpful to a child who feels disenfranchised in their own life and I just know that that's not true it's playing to the lowest common denominator I mean talk about a show Mr. Rogers would hate he would absolutely (laughs) despise Dan Schneider shows wait say more to those who don't know I mean literally the motivation for the reason why he created his programming is because he hated the current shows of the day for kids. It was a lot of like violent cartoons, like Tom and Jerry type stuff. Yeah. And he knew that it wasn't going to like contribute to the growth of the child in any way. So he's like, okay, if they're going to watch TV, then we might as well put something of value on TV. Yeah. And once you pass a certain age... (laughs) It's not going to be so easy. Like for ba- babies can watch Mr. Rogers really easily because it's kind of like hypnotizing. But it, that gets harder and harder to do as they get older. And would have been interesting to know like what Mr. Rogers, atta- what, what his attempt at a teen show would be. I doubt it would have worked. He would have needed somebody to like help him, I think. It's like anti-Mr. Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> They're high moral values. <laughs> Yes. So our memories of Zoe 101. We treated the new Zoe 101 coming on like our show, you know. With Zoe 101, it was like, we are going to tune in for the premiere of the new episode. I'm pretty sure it was on at like 7.30. You really remember. Yeah, I think. Well, I'm pretty sure our bedtime was like 8.30 at the time. I remember when mine got pushed to 9.30 and I was like... Wow. Yeah. I'm so grown up. Yeah, it might have been on at 8 30. I don't know, but I just remember that we would like actually actively go and watch the new episodes and it yeah. felt like a soap opera or something. Like the stakes fell a lot higher than they were within the story. The Chase and Zoe relationship, which was entirely carried on the back of Sean Flynn. I know. Obviously. He did so good. Was- I know, was very easy to get invested in. A bunch of the episodes we covered touch upon that quite heavily. So we'll talk about that more in the second half. Yeah. This show felt like a teen drama, like a real teen drama to me, even though now that we've watched it again, I don't know if it actually Mm. fits the bill. (laughs) No. But there's elements of it. I also wrote down that I remembered it feeling oddly mature- And also kind of horny. But we didn't know that. It was just some kind of like feeling that you, you were picking up on something, but you didn't, you couldn't quite put your finger on it. Yes. It was like some sort of edge. I mean, what is with his upset? We'll talk about this in the second half, but what is with his obsession with writing the line of dialogue? Do you want to make out? I was like, again, I saw an episode of Victorious last night. It was in there too. That same line. Do you remember that? episode of drake and josh that was about tying a cherry stem with your tongue yep girls are used in such an ornamental fashion in dan schneider shows like extras not only not only the main cast but also girls as extras are used to like be draped over guys and it's like that's true it's really weird to watch so before we go on break you guys may or may not have noticed that for the past several several months we have had the regal (laughs) unlimited logo at the bottom of our show art yes and we're very excited to say that we are working with regal again Mm -hmm. um for the foreseeable future i don't know (laughs) yeah and we're super excited about that and we have like a fun idea that we're gonna do you'll know when it happens yeah you will know. <laughs> now that we're working with Regal again, Hannah can regale us on her personal Regal Unlimited experience. With my Regal Unlimited membership, Josh and I went and saw Love Lies Bleeding over the past weekend. Would recommend to anyone gay or not gay. We said this in the Discord chat the other day because I was just, I was high on life at the moment <laughs> when we found out 
that our show had the highest conversion rate for Regal Unlimited because, you know, they put their ads in a few shows Mm -hmm. and our people just so happened to be the most active and actually got Regal Unlimited, (laughs) which is very exciting for us. Yes. By all means, continue the trend. We will be putting the link in the description with our code. When we say thank you to Regal, it's not us just being like, and thank you to our sponsor, Regal. Like, I think you guys have been able to tell, like, with the guests we had last season and just, like, our approach to the sponsorship in general, that they're genuinely really, really nice people (laughs) and really supportive of the show and, like, listen to it. Like, they're in it for the long haul and they really appreciate us as people, which is really appreciated. So if you are in the market for like a membership service and you're debating between a couple different places you should do regal because they're also really nice people on top of having a good deal that we can broker (laughs) so thank you regal we love you deeply i know we shouldn't direct people to go to paramount plus and stream zoe 101 but you could I would say watch Quiet on Set on Max because yeah. it will color your reviewing if you decide to in an interesting way and in a way that actually could be worth your while. Like, I don't think a pure rewatch, because at least for me, like doing a pure rewatch of Zoe 101 is like not satisfying. Like I need to like think about other things. A good refresher and also informative of what the climate was like for them back then and they don't really talk about Zoe 101 really at all in almost at all other than Alexa. Yeah. Um, in Quiet On Set. So it's not like the main, main focus, but it is in there. Okay. So the episodes that we covered, season one, episode one, welcome to PCA. <laughs> I wrote PSA. <laughs> welcome to PSA. Uh, season two, episode two, Time Capsule. Season two, episode 12, Spring Breakup. Season 3, Episode 22, Miss PCA. And Season 4, Episode 12, Chasing Zoe. And meet us back here. Watch, don't watch. Whatever you're comfortable with. (laughs) Welcome back, students of Pacific Coast Academy. You may or may not be being bullied by an adult man. It's time. (laughs) to go through these episodes. So the first episode of the show is called Welcome to PCA. The synopsis that I pulled for this is really long for some reason, but I actually feel like it's kind of worth it because it sets up a lot of the characters. Zoe Brooks and her younger brother, Dustin, are new students at Pacific Coast Academy, an elite boarding school in California. While there, Zoe meets Chase Matthews, a friendly guy with high (laughs) hopes of getting a girlfriend. Oh, okay. Chase leads Zoe to her dorm where she meets Nicole Bristow, a savvy girl who is easily a what the oh, no. who is easily attracted to hot boys okay and dana cruz a tomboy who what? does not accept diversity <laughs> a boy named logan reese challenges what? the girls to a basketball match logan picks his team which includes chase and michael barrett another friendly guy who what Who wrote this? I kind of love it. (laughs) Another friendly guy who is willing to accept a challenge. Zoe chooses her team, which includes Nicole, Dana, and Quinn Penske, a meddlesome scientist who is always (laughs) inventing wacky items. The girls lose the basketball game by one point, prompting Logan to tease them. The coach of the basketball team then asks Zoe and Dana if they want to join the basketball team because they helped the most. Zoe accepts while Dana says she will, quote, think about it. A Tom boy who does not accept diversity it the way they said it doesn't make sense like she has an attitude towards playing basketball with the boys because oh. she's like this is stupid and the school has just opened up to having girls attend right they didn't even mention that in this no that synopsis. that's like the seed of zoe 101 is it's really weirdly focused on gender like from moment one when you find out via dialogue like PCA is open to girls now. (laughs) I did not remember that part either until we actually started watching it. Okay, well now, 
we've gotten into it. So let's talk about our thoughts on this episode. I did not remember that at all, but it does add a significant amount of flavor to it. Yeah, I did. Because I can never forget that fucking weird urinal thing that Really? Happens. Does that like haunt you? It's notable. <laughs> it just is. The The whole thing is that like their dorms still have urinals in them, even though they're girls dorms, which like that seems like a really easy thing to fix. Like maybe, right. <laughs> maybe fix that. I noticed like a whole slew of innuendos, even in the season, pr- even in the show premiere. Um, there were a lot. Yeah. And they're so little. That's like the main thing you notice I when know. you watch the show premiere is like, these are babies. There's a jock strap joke. What's her face? Nicole says, I'll call you the scissor wizard. Yeah. Um, and the then first Jamie want to make like, out happens. Yeah. yeah. The blocking. I mean, this is aside from innuendo. The feeling of discomfort <laughs> that is so physically present in all these kids is like you can't even ignore it like they just yeah the blocking is really awkward like their delivery is really awkward in the first episode they just you know they're children and they're new at this job so you can really feel that yeah and as the show goes on it's like no this is like a real group of friends like you can tell that they yes have this rapport with each other but in the first episode it's like what I think outdoor and no laugh track dan schneider is really weird to experience yeah it is not the normal way things go like i think a lot of the awkward shit would be less excruciating if there was a laugh track but there isn't so you're just kind of left to like marinate and how weird it is i still prefer this format even though It doesn't work as well with his writing at all, but I still prefer it. Like I always will choose something closer to reality if it's possible. (laughs) But yeah, it's, it's super weird when you hear the first like kind of joke and there's no laughing. You're like, yeah. Or there's like background music and that's it. Why with the whole like needing to pee thing in the beginning? I don't know. I'm just like, why does everything have to be just a little weird? Because that's what he depends on. That, yeah. That's that's all he has to hold up his entire framework of humor. Like, he's got the humor of a, a seven-year-old boy. If you did, like, a perv reading of this episode, it's, like, bottomless. Yeah. Like, if, if you are looking for stuff to be weird, you'll yeah. never run out. And that, that felt true, I think, even when we watched it. In the beginning, we just had so less information. Yeah. So, like, it's like when you're exposed to something new as a child, you kind of inherently think it's cool because it's new and because, I mean, it's on TV. So, clearly, yeah, it must be cool, right? Um, Mm -hmm. I also think it's really interesting to think about the fact that, like, how is it that all of our parents collectively like weren't around when we watched these shows? Because like I know. if I feel like if I ever have a child, like I'm just going to be really intrigued by the children's programming of the day, like regardless of what it is. Yeah. But I get it. Like they want to watch their shit and like we're, we're in the basement like playing or whatever. <laughs> right. Right. So I get it. But it made a huge difference i isn't it just weird to think about like a generation of children watching this man's shows alone there's so much trust placed in nickelodeon as a brand yeah. like a an un, kind of unbelievable level of trust but also parents weren't as skeptical at the time that's um, true. I, I, there's a lot more questioning going on now you know be skeptical of everyone especially people who are in positions of power like let's mm-hmm. think about that so that just wasn't really a thing and also you could just assume it's like oh it's nickelodeon everything on that channel is being passed through so many levels of approval but you can't trust those levels <laughs> like, no you can't it's not a great show premiere um and i no. think that has a lot to do with the fact that these are children who are very clearly nervous <laughs> and yeah. They don't know who their characters are. So they're just floating around. They're doing what they can. 
The next episode is season two, episode two, Time Capsule. A time capsule project is presented to Zoe and her friends. Each one of them must contribute something that represents them. Zoe makes a DVD explaining what each of her friends means to her. Chase can't wait for 20 years, so he decides to <laughs> dig up the capsule with a very tired Michael. I remember this episode really well. This was like one of the most like relevant to the drama of the show. Yep. The, the will they, won't they. The um, deep will they, won't they. Yeah. You just want to know. I mean, to sustain a will they, won't they for four seasons, like, is a feat. Um, I, it's actually yeah. the only storyline that kept the show, kept me wanting to yeah. watch the show. And yeah, that does completely have to do with Chase. It has nothing to do with Jamie Lynn. Nope. She brought the charisma of a brick to this yeah, show it's true like, one of my main notes or or thoughts around jamie lynn's acting in this show is that the uh, she resorts to anger in her delivery so quickly <laughs> I know. that i i can't help but think that that reflects herself in how quickly she resorts to anger or sass because kids often, I mean, it's not like she's like a method actress. Like she's yeah. got, she doesn't have much to go off of. And the Dan Schneider tone definitely does get mean. It gets yeah. mean pretty fast, but there are so many moments where you could read those lines in a completely <laughs> calm way you can just deliver them differently. They're not required to be angry. And she chose to be angry every yeah. time. I mean, there is a part of me that thinks it's, it definitely wasn't intentional, but like there being a kind of grumpy <laughs> lead girl is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, it, it but that's is, just a byproduct. Yeah. I don't even think that's on purpose. I think um, it just ended up that way because Jamie Lynn just so happened to be kind of a grumpy person. <laughs> yeah. Cause yeah, like, yeah. He writes his female protagonist so void of soul. Yeah. Tori Vega, no soul. I Carly, no I Carly, soul. I Carly, no soul. And, and yeah. it sucks. Um, meanwhile, he'll make the side characters like freaks. Yeah. But the main character cannot have any defining trait. And so, yeah, you're right. Like, Jamie Lynn <laughs> incidentally brought this, like, crazy... Uh, mean bitterness yeah. to the protagonist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then none of the other girls did that. But <laughs> no, I mean, Miranda Cosgrove and iCarly, like, even when it was coming out, I, like, couldn't take yeah. the awkwardness. And it was so <sighs> strange because we loved School of Rock and I really loved her as Megan on Drake and Josh. And yeah. um, we were talking about this the other day and I was like, I just... I honestly think it's partially the fact that she was coming of age on this show. So she's growing into herself in so many ways. And yeah. also the fact that being in the protagonist role on one of his shows just means that you are now being asked to be the prettiest, blandest version of yourself. Everyone around you will be high camp, but yeah. you can't have any of that. It makes complete sense why she was good in School of Rock, why she was good in Drake and Josh, and then yeah. just had nothing to offer in iCarly because it's kind of Hillary Duffish also a little That's bit. That's true. That's true. Why is Nicole talking about looking chesty? I don't like it. I can't answer that. <laughs> yes. The fact that Zoe lives a parent free life and also has an awesome motor scooter vespa vespa and a cute boy likes her yeah i'm like this bitch she gets too much like for she being, does get too much for being that mean like right. you don't karmically like you don't deserve <laughs> all her this. karmic lineage as they say why are they always eating grapes on this show why are they always drinking blicks <laughs> It's his proprietary energy drink yeah. in the in the universe of these shows. Yeah, and, and this episode also has a lot of like fake technology stuff, holograms, and like yes. Quinn coming in on the TV. Like that was weird. Yeah, that that was weird. Yeah, I was like, oh, this school's very high tech. Right. I guess that is like the rampant materialism element. But to me, it's yeah. like they don't talk about it. They just have no. It. 
it just exists, which almost makes you think it's like in the future, but it's I know. That's kind of how I felt about it. I think on some level I was like, cause I never thought of them as like rich kids except for Logan. The truth is they were. And Logan was just very rich. Yeah. (laughs) I thought it was funny that Victoria justice's character, like, wouldn't put something in the time capsule because it's not like that takes any level of thought like she could have just like put an earring in there and been like this is it because i love fashion (laughs) like why i know it didn't make any sense and also it was funny when her whole thing is that she was gonna like convince the teacher to give her a good grade without having the acting was terrible Yeah, the whole concept is that she was going to, like, act her way to a good grade, and it was, like, absolutely atrocious. It worked, though. They decided it would work. That was strange. But the main thing about this episode is that you get teased again. For some reason, Zoe decides to contribute a essentially long vlog. She talks about what all of her friends mean to her, and she basically tells Chase, like, I talked about you on my DVD, and she's like, I talked about you. And he was like, oh, oh, what'd you say? And she was like, you'll find out in 20 years. And then he gets in so a wave, anxious. <laughs> I, right. He gets so anxious that he makes Michael go dig up the thing with him. And then he gets the DVD and then he puts it in his computer and he like gets to the part that's about him. And he's like, he wakes up Michael again and is like, is this, Shouldn't right? have done that. <laughs> is this the right thing to do? And then Michael's like, I think you know the answer, which that's a good lesson. It is a good lesson, but I have kind of a controversial take, maybe, which is that that character, Michael as a character only exists to like steer chase. The best friendness of it can come off a little bit. It gives me a weird feeling, especially because he's the only black main cast character. I mean, yeah, I'm glad he's not a caricature. I think they were probably trying to be careful of that. But yeah, it feels a little calculated because he is the only black main cast character. Okay, our next episode is season two, episode 12, Spring Breakup. The gang is invited to Logan's dad's mansion for spring break, only to find out that they are being used for testing a new reality show called Gender Defenders. Now it's boys against girls, and when Chase accidentally sends a text message to Zoe proclaiming his true feelings for her, (laughs) they start to wonder if it's spring break or spring bummer. Gender Defenders is just so funny. It's really funny. One important thing about this episode, too, is that it was a 45 minute episode. And so when this one came out, it was like a big deal. They really built up the drama with this one. And the truth is that I fast forwarded. It's not worth watching (laughs) a lot because it's like you have to watch them do all these challenges. It's an actual reality show. The only thing in this episode that I was even sort of, you know, clued into or interested in is the end. The end will leave you shook. But the entire episode leading up to the end is extremely boring. And I'm sure a lot of you, if you watch the show, will remember this because it's just like genuinely a tragic moment Yes, where after they've done this whole show thing and initially it was like only one gender could actually win and go on the show on actual TV. That was what was posed to them. Mm -hmm. But then after it's all said and done, Logan's dad is like, actually, you all were just on the first episode because they have hidden cameras in like the bushes. (laughs) And it's just like full size dudes with full cameras just like stepping out from around corners. That was funny to me. So like at that point, the entire plot line of the episode is like tied up except for the Chase thing. What happens is that Chase texts Zoe accidentally saying that he loves her. They always use L, the L (laughs) word, which is funny. And he steals her phone to, to delete, delete the text but in stealing her phone he ends up like costing the girls team like a challenge win or something and so then jamie lynn aka zoe is like why did you delete it what did you say what did you say i'll believe you yeah. if you just tell me and he won't tell her and then he's like i'm gonna face the music and he finally <laughs> texts her that he loves her when they're and watching audrey, the premiere 
yes. of gender defenders. You have to note, before he texts her this, though, Zoe comes into the common room and she's like, where's Chase? And they're like, he's out by the fountain. So then she goes out, meets him at the fountain, and he's like depressed listening to music yeah. sitting on the fountain. What was the message you sent to me by mistake? Tell me. I'd really rather not tell you. Why? Was it mean? Huh? Did you say something mean about me? No. God, no. It was it was nothing like that. I'd never say anything mean about you. Then what could you have written that was so important to hide from me? You really want to know? Yeah. You're sure? I really want to know. <sighs> OK. The message Guys! is that Guys, the show starts in like 30 seconds. Oh, we're not letting you miss it. Can we just have a no, come on, come on. Let's go, Let's go now. Right now. Chase is looking at Zoe, watching the show, decides to text her that he loves her. Yes. And you think that her holster is going to glow. <laughs> yeah. Her phone <laughs> holster. Her tech thing. mate. Yeah, yeah, like they all they all look like middle-aged dads with these. I was about to say holsters. the same thing. Yeah. But they zoom in on her holster and it's empty. Yes. And then they cut to her little sidekick phone out on the fountain, vibrating. It vibrates into the fountain and the screen goes black. And no. and then you get the sad piano version it's of the tragic. theme song. I remember this episode when it came out because the that ending like yeah. burnt into my brain. Yeah. I and was that, like, and, no way. <laughs> yes, and it was like in those moments where it did give you the teen drama energy that you wanted. Yeah. Most of the time, the show is like fl- like a fluffy yeah, whatever. But then occasionally, it will serve up something that you actually are uh, invested in. That you in. want. There was a lot of filler in this episode, but the ending is yeah. great. Yeah. I felt really bad that Dustin had to do that like weird fake shaking thing the whole I episode know. because he had like theoretically OD'd on the on the energy drink. Okay, next episode, season three, episode twenty two, Miss PCA. Logan's friends make him realize that his dad's money isn't enough to get him into a good college. Not true. I have news. <laughs> um, so he decides to start an extracurricular activity. Miss PCA, a beauty contest where the goal is for him to select PCA's prettiest girl. Zoe and Lola initially find the idea sexist, but change their minds when they learn that the winner will be featured in the popular Buzz magazine. Their friendship is put to a test when Lola thinks Zoe intentionally picked out a better dress for herself than she did for her. Meanwhile, Michael's jokes amuse everyone in the group except Quinn, who never laughs at anything he says or does. Annoyed by that fact, he sets out to find something he can do that will make her laugh. I picked this episode for us because I thought that it would be really reprehensible, to be totally honest, and it wasn't bad, actually. It wasn't. It could have been a lot worse. I do yeah. think that having the young girls fight in dresses in mud physically yeah, that was weird is like the ickiest thing and they also self insert gross thoughts into the boys characters when they actually yeah. wouldn't be there so like victoria and uh, jamie lynn start fighting in literal mud in dresses right. and then the michael and chase are over there and they're like girls fighting and then they're like, oh, let's go run over there to watch girls fighting in mud. You know, it's like, yeah, you're, yeah. you're inserting a gaze onto them that they don't necessarily have. And actually, we basically know that Chase isn't likely to have yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. The other part where she's like trying on the dresses and yeah. he makes some He's comment. like ogling. He said, oh. it's flattering. Yes. And then she goes, do you need a drink of water? And he says, yeah. yes. It's out of character. Like yourself. Yeah. The writers were inserting thoughts that don't make sense onto yep. boy characters. Like now if it was Logan, yeah, he's like supposed to be that way, I guess. But like Logan's character to be so absurdly annoying that yeah. I can't, like I actually can't. It's really creepy. It's super, I feel like super that- creepy. 
I had some really weird experiences in early middle school, Audrey knows, with really like creepy borderline like sexual harassment from kids my age in like sixth grade. And it's like they were just acting like that guy. Yeah. And it's like that is a problem. Yeah. Like I don't I don't know on what planet there's an excuse for that sort of character to be created for children to consume and to portray him as a part of this friend group almost never get ostracized for it. Yeah. Partially because he's rich and the kids are the kids can benefit yeah. through Logan's connections and they think he's attractive and he thinks he's attractive now they are grossed out by him like they will outwardly be like get away from me but he's benefiting based off of like his looks like that is the reason why he's able to sustain being in this friend group yes it just struck me that he's kind of like the super junior version of like a chuck bass yeah Looking back at it, it's like, okay. They kind of gave like, him the Chuck Bass treatment, too. They did. They rehabilitated they did. him. <laughs> they did. Yeah. Yeah. Which I guess um, that's good. Like, if you were someone like me and you saw a mean girl on TV and you were like, oh, cool girls are mean, then you could watch, like, or something. Cool guys like, you could watch are that. assholes. <laughs> yeah. Or, like, are predatory. Okay. It's time for the finale episode. Season four, episode 12, Chasing Zoe. The end of the school year is approaching, and that means prom is too. For some reason, that's all I could find. A lot has come to pass by the time you get to season four, episode 12, and we missed all that. So it's like... Austin Butler is a series regular. He's Zoe's boyfriend. (laughs) Chase is gone. Um, He's in England. Um, Quinn and Logan are in an ongoing romance, but it's secret. There's so many things. I I was... I almost wanted to go back and be like, when did these things start? I know. Oh, and Victoria Justice has a boyfriend. That guy, um... If you're a Secret Life watcher, he is like the gay character on Secret Life of the American Teenager. And when he stepped out with Victoria Justice, it made me so happy to see him. I liked this episode. I thought I I actually thought this was a good ending. It felt feel good in all the ways that it it should. Mm-hmm. They did give like Quinn and Logan, they kind of almost give them a bigger reveal in a way than zoe and chase but okay the main thing that i would change about this episode is chase didn't need to physically fall off a wall and downstairs so chase calls her zoe has decided not to go to the prom and she like won't just say that it's because she's sad that chase isn't around and she breaks up with austin butler's character who is Austin Butler. So clearly that's a high value date and she just rejected him. So she's walking around. After he gave her a necklace with I love you inscribed in the back. Yeah. I'm like, this is, yeah. the, The girls are like, what are you doing? Like, this is all you could ever want. So she's walking around campus all sad. And then Chase calls her and, she thinks that he's still in England. He pulls a Troy Bolton on her. That's a, that's a Troy yeah. Bolton in the third <laughs> yeah. movie. And then he's like, turn around or whatever. And then he's sitting on top of this like stairway. And then he yep. falls off the wall. And then he falls down a set of stairs. And she runs up to him and is like, are you bleeding? And then he's like, yeah. And she's like, can you feel this? And he's like, kind of. And then she kisses <laughs> As she, as she like, touches his wounds. I think it was supposed to be a moment of, like, chemistry. It but... was. <laughs> Can you feel this? Kinda. How about this? really it's like by the point that it actually happens it's all kind of water under the bridge it's more like yeah, okay it's like we know <laughs> we yeah it's like a relief that it happened but no one is like obsessed with how the kiss went down they go back to the dance and michael is really excited to see chase and so he like gives him this big bear hug and so he's like don't break my boyfriend oh yeah and yeah. 
it's just so... honestly thank god <laughs> thank god she said it and then mike oh it's cute though when michael sees that he's back from england like that was cute yeah. you know it's a happy ending for all just them dancing at the dance it's cute um yeah. the, the the one thing in this episode though that is very regrettable and should not exist is michael's oh. plot line he's got this whole thing about yes. learning to drive and for some reason they decided to do this like elaborate old man like old asian man joke that it's a karate kid thing right but it still is not good because none of us watching we that know knew that. what that was no yeah. I literally skipped over though. Me those too. Parts. The majority. Yeah. Because I was like, I don't give a shit. And I know what yeah. the end result will be. It was a highly racist portrayal of like an old Chinese man with a really heavy accent teaching him how to drive stick shift with and like then strange methods. Yes. And then like disappearing at the end and being like a figment of his imagination. Yep, and totally unnecessary. And why is that in your like show wrap up? Like, what do you what are you doing? What yeah. are you doing? Yeah, it was really odd. I guess they were like, we have to give him some sort of plot because everyone else has something. And he can learn to drive without that being the plot, though. I wish that his girlfriend or that his date had taught him how to drive instead yeah, of yeah. And they could have done that. some weird shit about gender and just kept right. it. <laughs> Like, right. just kept it to their <laughs> usual. Keep it, <laughs> yeah. Keep it to the weird gender stuff without having to drag in race stuff also. Yeah. Also, not really her weird. being on iCarly.com. I know. They were on iCarly.com twice in this episode. Yeah. Dan it's Schneider all one universe. Loves, he loves to make a universe of weird, weird teenage behavior. Doesn't it just really inspire you to... It's like, well, shit, if somebody that awful could create a terrible multi-show teen, like, teen girl show universe, it's like, put that in the hands of somebody who can do something good with it. Like, Yeah, agreed. Because theoretically, I, I mean, I do, except for Drake and Josh, maybe his show's are pandered towards girls, mostly. They've yeah. got... Like balanced cast though, so it's kind of like any yeah. you know anyone could watch it, but it's just weird to think about a grown man just des deciding what teen girls will like retroactively. He's creating a culture. He did. Yeah, yeah, that's really true. Like the random stuff. Yeah, it, it's just really strange to think about. I feel like when you're writing for young audiences. There's kind of two paths you can go and it depends on how young the audience is, but you can try to like make it a moral teaching in some way. Or yeah, which you can I wouldn't go for necessarily either. There shows that balance. Yeah. Well, and I think the other approach is you can write from your own lived experience from that age, but anything else, especially if you're a man writing it for majority girls just feels really weird. I mean, he's created such a high volume mm -hmm. of episodes that, like, obviously he would exhaust his own experiences pretty fast. Things got so out of hand by the time his era was ending in terms of absurdity. Yeah. Zoe 101 Definitely. is extremely grounded by comparison. And we should mention he did post a freaking response to quiet on set on the Dan warp YouTube channel that it's like a 20 minute long video where the man who sells smoothies on iCarly interviews. Him. <laughs> I really would love to know the greater context around that video. It's very strange. It's stilted and it's him apologizing for things that are very unnuanced to apologize for like surface yeah. level he's apologizing for things that are very clearly wrong in a in a cookie cutter way it, he's missing the nuance though and the comments are off so there's really no yeah he's not allowing a discourse which i also hate yeah i mean but it's like what's the freaking point why post an apology when you're not willing to take the discourse and, uh, and yes it's going to be a lot of mean comments for sure which is like a toll to mental health for sure but 
I think you can handle it. It's like, are you going to deal with it or not? Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's either all of it or it's none of it. And he's basically chosen none of it in a sense. Yeah. Like, he's trying to have his cake and eat it, too. Basically. Yeah. End of the day. At the end of the what? day, you're another day older. You're another day older. <laughs> I never need to watch this show again, ever. No, me either. I can appreciate the role that it played as what felt like my first real TV show. Yeah. As a kid. And and I can also say, because I wasn't exposed to a lot of inappropriate things at too early of an age, I didn't see innuendo the same way at the time. It, I can't say that it necessarily affected me in in the yeah. sense that everyone's talking about. If something is inappropriate for kids in retrospect, but they don't even know that it's inappropriate, what does that mean? I feel like that's kind of the question that's being posed. Yeah. Is like, if they don't know, was there harm? I think it's like a question of like exploitation and like power tripping. Yeah. To like make kids do all these innuendos. It just comes off as being really pervy on the yeah. parts of the adults. Yeah. And then looking back at it and these kids being like, that's so humiliating. Yeah. Why didn't anyone stop this? I think that's really real. And I even what I was just posing really was only in reference to the child viewer. Yeah. In oh, terms yeah, yeah, of the, yeah. In terms of the child actor uh, it's like repulsive it, it's yes. like how 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 did you as an adult with an adult conscience allow all of these jokes to come out of the mouths of kids who had no idea what they were saying like I just yeah. don't get how you can do that and broadcast it for millions like on every level it's like failure and yeah. I think that the executives are really, really, really actually the ones who should be called into question on this. Because mm -hmm. most of the issues brought up in Quiet on Set have more to do with the execs at Nickelodeon than they do with Dan Schneider. Who hired Dan Schneider in the first place? Who paid him? Who decided how much the writers will be paid? Who decided mm -hmm. what programming is okay? Who decided what um, kind of like tone their channel was going to go for that's none of that was actually decided by dan schneider himself so like yeah where are those people yeah it's a really and good question all it is for the execs is business decisions they're not really using their nuanced thought yeah um it would like they're seem. not thinking they're not doing media literacy work in no. their mind yeah no. no and wouldn't it be so great for that to exist within like the executive level on a base level like kids just need to be protected that's the number one thing and they were not really when you watch it when you watch quiet on set and even just if you're hearing little bits about it like as far as we know the kids on this show did not get the absolute worst treatment of the kids that were involved in this like machine or but, they just decided not to say right as far as we know what do we do with these shows it remains to be seen i guess what's concerning about them being so readily available is Hopefully kids are just disinterested in humor of 15 years ago or whatever. Yeah. Um, like, and they probably are. But yeah. it's just like kids don't need to be watching Hillbilly Moment. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, Yeah, you're right. We don't like I again, I rewatched <laughs> that the other day and I could not believe. I forgot about that. All it is is knock knock. Who's there? hunk of meat i'ma hit you in the head with a hunk of meat ha 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 ha, ha. Yeah. that's yeah, the whole yeah, thing yeah. i forgot about that i guess that's it that's it um but i we would love this dialogue to be continued on discord like i know yeah. probably a lot of you guys have watched quiet on set it's very relevant yeah. so it is if you have any hot takes or just like want to start contributing to that thread i think i will start that yeah the day this definitely airs. So, 
As always, you can find more from us at evergreenpodcast.com slash sleepover dash cinema and keep up with our latest creative projects at tupingproductions.com. We're on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube at Sleepover Cinema and post a full video version of each episode on YouTube every Thursday. You can follow me, Audrey, at Audrey A. Leach on everything. And you can follow me, Hannah, at Real Judy Garland on Instagram. And again, if you would like to join our conversation about everything we talked about today, join our Discord if you haven't yet, and the link is in the episode description. You can check out our merch at twopingproductions.com slash shop. We have t-shirts, sweatshirts, stickers, and more. And if you love sleepover cinema, if you are looking to unpack your feelings on all of the drama that has come to pass over the last month or so, share the episode with a friend you are processing it with, a family member, a sister. Leave us a review letting us know what movies or TV shows or music you would like to see us cover next. Sleepover Cinema is a production of Evergreen Podcasts, produced, edited, and engineered by us, Hannah, and Audrey Leach. Sleepover Cinema is mixed by Sean Roll Hoffman with theme music by Josh Perlman Hall. Executive producer is Michael D'Aloya.